Hello fellow bakers, I am Tanya. Welcome to my table. Today is all about baking with wheat flour. Not to be confused with whole wheat flour, I'm talking about any flour that is derived from the wheat plant. Welcome to Gluten 101. Everything you wish your mama had told you about baking, aka understanding gluten and baking. There are a lot of misconceptions about gluten, like gluten containing foods are bad for you. This is a myth. Grains that contain gluten, such as barley and rye, are whole grains and provide beneficial fiber, vitamins and minerals to your diet. Eating gluten adds protein to your diet. It's a fact. Gluten is protein. And the myth that eating a gluten-free diet will help you lose weight. Well, in order for some gluten-free foods to have texture and taste, they have sugar and fat added to them. So trying to find gluten-free foods may actually lead to a diet less varied and has fewer food choices. So, gluten is not a four-letter word. Don't get me wrong, I understand that in today's society, there are a lot of people who cannot have gluten. For these poor souls, I am truly sorry. We can discuss gluten-free baking in another video, but today I'm going to talk about what gluten is, we're going to learn about what gluten does, and what role it plays in baking. Also, we will learn how to become inspired bakers, bakers that produce amazing home-baked goods. You have probably heard the old adage that anyone can cook, but baking is a science. Well, both can be performed a lot better if we understand some of the science behind the ingredients we use. So, here we go. What is gluten? Gluten is the strong, sticky, stretchy protein that forms when wheat flour and water mix. It's remarkable stuff. It gives structure to baked goods and helps wheat flour morph into many different foods. Tender pie crusts, perfect pasta, fluffy pancakes, waffles, crisp pastry, and chewy artisan bread or even the perfect fudge brownie. The deal is, and this is key, not every baked good requires the same amount of gluten. Yeast red dough relies heavily on gluten for structure, so lots of it is needed. That's why a pizza or bread dough recipe will instruct you to do a lot of mixing and kneading. However, encouraging gluten to form is the last thing you want to do when making other baked goods that use baking soda or baking powder, such as cakes, cookies, or scones, as well as flaky or tender pastries. Too much gluten makes biscuits into hockey pucks, creates rubbery pancakes, and can make tough inedible pie crusts. Fortunately, Limiting gluten production is a fairly simple matter. The first thing we need to do is start with the right flour. Most supermarkets carry a variety of wheat flours, all-purpose flour, cake flour, whole wheat flour, and bread flour. You will also see flours made from grains other than wheat. For instance, flours made from rye, rice, corn, oat, or buckwheat, but these form little or no gluten. This is why gluten-free baking can be tricky. We depend on gluten for the texture of our favorite baked goods. So as we are talking gluten today, we will focus on those flours. The various wheat flours all contain gluten-forming proteins. The type of flour can determine the quality and quantity of those proteins. Bread flour and durum semolina, which is used for pasta, contain the most protein, 12 to 15 percent, and form strong, high-quality gluten strands. These so-called hard flours are ideal 
for yeast raised breads and pasta because the strong gluten gives the heavy dough structure and allows the finished product a pleasant chewy texture. Pastry and cake flours contain less protein, 7 to 9%, and form weaker gluten strands. With their low levels of weak gluten, these soft flours produce a more tender product, so they're usually preferable for cakes, cookies, biscuits, and many pastries. True to its name, all-purpose flour is a decent choice for almost everything. It has 9 to 12% protein. All-purpose flour has a middle-of-the-road protein content that allows it to work well in most recipes that the home baker would want to make. Both of the bakeries I owned used primarily all-purpose flour, and at home it is my go-to for all of my home baking. On a side note, whole wheat flour is very high in gluten-forming protein, but it's not the best choice for lofty breads because the shards of bran in the flour cut the strands of gluten, obstructing its development. This is why wheat bread usually has some white flour in it. Most is usually a 60-40 mixture. Canadian all-purpose flour is usually higher in gluten than most U.S. varieties, so it works especially well for yeast breads. And now we introduce water. Gluten doesn't exist until flour becomes wet. Water is what allows the two wheat proteins, glutenin and gliadin, to combine and form gluten. So by adding or withholding water from the dough or batter, you can encourage or deter the gluten's development. When you want to maximize gluten, a moderate amount of water is ideal. But if it's tenderness you're after, you can either deny your dough water, for instance, a pie crust, or drown it, like pancakes. It depends on what you're making. Flaky and tender pastry dough is better off thirsty. It's not just fussiness when a pie dough recipe tells you to dribble water into the dough drop by drop. It takes just a little too much water to create excess gluten and a tough pie crust. The same is true for biscuits and scones and muffins. Cake batters and some bread doughs need to drown. Once the gluten in a dough or batter is fully hydrated, adding more moisture actually dilutes and weakens the gluten. In cakes, excess moisture along with low protein flour and various softening ingredients contributes to tenderness. You will note on cake batter mixes the instructions will tell you to mix on medium or medium low speed for three to four minutes. This whips air into the mix and allows gluten to absorb the moisture. It also allows the cake batter to thicken. If the mix is overbeaten, it becomes tough with tunneling throughout, not nearly as enjoyable to eat. In artisan breads, excess water weakens the dough's gluten network, resulting in a crumb that has a large appealing hole rather than a fine uniform texture. Stirring, kneading, folding, mixing, all of these actions help gluten to stretch and organize itself into a network. The more you mix, the stronger the gluten becomes. Yeast doughs generally benefit from ample kneading, which elongates and smooths the gluten strands 
into a stretchy network that can expand and rise as the yeast ferments and releases gases. With many other baked goods, though, overmixing and forming too much gluten is an issue. Pie crusts and biscuits are especially tricky because you need some gluten to provide structure. Otherwise, the pie crust will crumble and the biscuits will slump, but it's easy to overdo it and create a tough result. Generally speaking, when tenderness is desired, it is wise to mix briefly and with a light hand. When it comes to pie crusts and biscuits, there's really no substitute for experience. It may take trial and error before you strike the perfect balance between tenderness and strength. Understand how other ingredients affect gluten. Fats weaken gluten. Solid fats, oils, and egg yolks coat gluten proteins and prevent them from forming long, strong strands. Ever wondered why shortening is called shortening? Well, it's because it shortens gluten strands. Fat can also make flour water resistant. For example, when making biscuits, the first step is to thoroughly work in the fat into the flour. Once coated with fat, the flour particles don't absorb much moisture when you add the wet ingredients, such as cream or water. It allows less gluten to be formed and the biscuit stays tender. Sugar hinders gluten, salt helps it. Sugar molecules encourage tenderness by attaching to the water molecules before they can bind with the glutenin and gliadin. Again, no water means no gluten. Salt, on the other hand, makes gluten stickier and stronger. A tip to the wise, always read the recipe before you start to see what instructions there are to deal with the flour. In cookies, for instance, you are instructed to beat all the wet ingredients until light and fluffy, and only then do you add the flour and leavening. This allows the flour to become coated in fats and egg when you mix it in a cup at a time, weakening the gluten. This makes for a more tender product. Another side note, in almost all recipes, sugar is considered a wet ingredient. This is because generally the sugar is used to mix with and bind water molecules. This prohibits the sugar crystal from reforming. It is bonded to the water molecule, weakening the gluten in the product. We're almost there, I promise. Now back to the brownie. Generally, when a brownie recipe is cakey, spongy, or dry, it is because the ingredients have been put together incorrectly or it's been overmixed, or both. Start with the wet ingredients in a bowl, including sugar. Pour this over the dry ingredients and fold until combined. Never use a mixer and always use a light hand. If it's a boxed mix, the same light hand is needed, although the sugar will be with the dry ingredients. A second method for combining your batter is to mix together the eggs, sugar, vanilla, and salt, then add flour without mixing, and then add the melted butter or oil mix with the cocoa and you will have three layers in your bowl. Then with a light hand, fold the ingredients together. This is the method I usually use for brownies merely out of habit. I realize this may have been a little long, but understanding gluten is the first step to baking and your key to success. You would be surprised how many of us don't know what gluten is or how it works. Thank you for coming along 
with me on this ride today. And I look forward to seeing you next time. Bye.